ask Dr. Tom Mickelson to come up. Dr. Mickelson is the head of the Ontario Brain Institute, and he is the Ontario Brain Institute gives the majority of the funding for the for the Pont Network. So we are indebted to them, um, not only as our funding source, but the additional supports that they provide for communication, for translation of findings to clinical practice, for helping us talk to government, affecting policy, and so on. So uh, I will stop and I'll ask Dr. Mickelson to come up. Good morning. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming out on a kind of a gray evening, and I think or gray morning. What it, I think what it does is uh, illustrate what value you guys place in Dr. Anna Ignacio in particular in the PON program at large. So at the OBI, we uh, basically don't do biomedical research for the sake of doing the research. The idea is to make sure that we're doing research with impact. We're kind of the uh, transition between the government dollars and the healthcare system, and I think the sort of philosophical argument is that we want to make sure that. We're moving the bar forward as far as doing stuff differently as far as clinical care goes and bringing the best research into clinical care. Basically, I think if you're dealing with disorders that are not you know, curable in the conventional sense, we should be working towards that, being smarter, faster, more appropriate as far as how the therapies go. We have five programs right now funded by the Ontario Brain Institute, and part of the idea is to bring these kind of philosophical arguments to each of those. And they range not just neurodevelopmental disorders, but cerebral palsy, treatment refractory epilepsy, depression, dementia, and a small program in concussion. There are a lot of intersections between those, and the idea is to not recreate the wheel each time, but to recognize that each piece of the research puzzle fits in the larger picture. And how we do things smarter, faster, with better imaging, better genes, etc., to the service of better clinical care. So it's not just for stamp collecting, as we call it, or, or the best paper in the, in the in biomedical journals, but to impact care with evidence. And this is what we're wanting to bring to the Ministry of Health and the government, our services that are underpinned by hard data with good outcomes that are important for folks living in the community with these neurodevelopmental disorders. The, uh, the day, of course, is, is uh, an epitome of the example of how patient input, both uh, to the agenda, but also the priority setting partnerships that happened over the last year, really just show how POND exemplifies the way that we at OBI want to see biomedical research with impact happen. So again, a great example, what we're doing is, is beating the, uh, uh, the, the doors on the government to show the value of this kind of uh, approach and, uh, and lead with, with the proof and the evidence that you guys are generating uh, to the service of, of, of the community. So uh, thank you very much and look forward to an important day. Just realize that when we look at biomedical research, the data is the data and the, you know, it's not just an intellectual exercise. The partnership with the patients is exactly what distinguishes us uh, in all of our programs from, from the, the standard way of doing things. So appreciate your input. Uh, it is uh, highly valued, and hopefully you feel the same, that the research is to the service of, of you as the community. So thank you very much and look forward to a good day. All right. So um, I'm going to start with the first topic you guys selected. We got tons of questions on this one, so I hope I um, give you some of the information you want. You can imagine that it's an enormous topic. Um, there is no way I'm going to cover every alternative treatment, and that's what I'm not what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to give you a bit of an approach on how we think about alternative treatments. I'm going to give you some examples of where we have actually good evidence. I'm going to give you some, some examples where we have evidence to not use, but of non-efficacy, and I'm going to give you some examples of where we have evidence of harm, and then I'm going to give you my approach of how I talk to families about alternative treatments and how we make decisions together about how we combine more traditional and more complementary uh, approaches to treatment. <clears throat> so I put my disclosures always up for the purposes of you knowing what my conflicts may be. <laughs> And I'm going to get to definitions. So com complementary and alternative medicine is a term that you see frequently. Um, I personally prefer the complementary and alternative treatments term because not all treatments are medicine, right? So the, in fact, the term is much bigger than what we traditionally do in medicine. But we basically refer to a group of practices or compounds that are um, being used for healthcare purposes, but they're not part of conventional medicine. Now, it is important to think about the word currently. 
Um, so it gets a little bit um, gray when something that has a lot of evidence and starts used by traditional medicine, Western medicine, whether it still remains a complementary treatment or not. So I see all kinds of things listed under complementary treatments that I would consider mainstream treatment because I do it all day long as a physician. Um, and so just to also understand that this, these concepts are fluid, right? So typically we think of complementary treatments as things that don't have a lot of evidence, but can maybe coming through the more natural route. But as these things acquire evidence, they become part of traditional medicine. And so it's not a dichotomy. They're not two different things. They're a spectrum of things. Uh, the other thing to remember is that complementary and alternative is not the exact same thing. So complementary treatments, we're talking about treatments that you use in addition to your traditional treatments, right? So you have a, a, port, a group of treatments that you do as part of your medical care, and then you add to it a couple of alternate complementary or alternative treatments, where alternative treatments traditionally are thought are, as of treatments that are instead of traditional medicine. And the risk, obviously, for those two approaches is different. So it's one thing if you add something to a regimen uh, that we may not have a lot of evidence for, but you want to try it out. It's another thing if you miss on an evidence-based intervention to try something that may not have evidence. So these two things are slightly different, and I will try to kind of highlight the points as I go through uh, to help you think through what's complementary and what may be actually alternative. It comes at the cost of an evidence-based treatment. All right. So common targets in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, sleep, very common, anxiety, attention symptoms, irritability, aggression. Some OCD symptoms are being targeted with alternative and complementary treatments, social function. And you can think of those uh, the treatments also as biological and non-biological. So a lot of them are products, compounds, pills, syrups that you take. Uh, some of them um, are other types of therapies that do not include you ingesting anything but they are still therapeutic and they have the potential to be therapeutic and they're being uh, offered as a therapeutic modality. I, I chose to give you most of the examples on the biological side, but then we can talk about um, the non-biologicals also, and I will try to leave some time for questions at the end, if I can. All right, so this is a Vecchia's classification. This is no official classification, uh, but this is how I think about uh, uh, classifying complementary and alternative treatments. There are some that are likely effective. They have an acceptable safety profile. So if the families want to do them, I encourage them to use it and I monitor with them to make sure that we have a safe practice. There are some that are well tolerated, but they have no evidence for efficacy in which case I would never recommend them, but if you choose to do them, I'm okay with it, and I will um, help you monitor and, and, and make sure that your child is safe. There's a third category which is well tolerated, and really we have evidence that they don't work. You won't get a recommendation from me for those treatments. In fact, you'll get me discouraging you to do those treatments. I still wanna know whether you're doing them now, because a lot of these treatments actually interact with other things I may wanna do, and the safety may change based on that interaction. So if I don't know that you are doing it, I may put you at risk. So you still tell me, but you have to be prepared that I will discourage you a bit from using them just because you're wasting your I, I believe you are wasting your money. And the last, last option is the hardest one. This is when we have evidence of harm. So no evidence of benefit and evidence of harm. You will get the strongest language from me trying to discourage you from those therapies. We don't all agree, but if you, you, you would expect from me an honest opinion in terms of the evaluation of the data, and then I'm going to truly discourage you from going that, down that route. But please still tell me that you are doing it. Please still tell your doctor that you are doing it, just to make sure that we minimize potential harm in terms of interactions and other things that we do. So now let me give you some examples. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to start with the obvious one, which is melatonin. So melatonin uh, is considered a natural supplement. This is one where I'm not quite sure where, that line, that the, the, where to draw the line between complementary treatments and actual mainstream treatments, because melatonin has become mainstream treatment for most of us, but it is still an over-the-counter supplement, which is why usually it's classified under the complementary and alternative treatments. 
in previous parent days, I showed you how to look at randomized control trials. Today, I'm going to show you how to read a meta-analysis. So I'll show you in a second. Can you see my... Oh, you cannot see my thing. Okay. So when we have a randomized control trial, uh, we have a, a group of kids who get the real thing. We have a group of kids who get the placebo or the sugar pill. And we try to make sure that the kids who get the drug outperform the kids who get the placebo or the sugar pill. Right? We've talked about this before. Now the question is, what if you have three, five, seven, nine different randomized control trials and they're all showing different things? How are you supposed to make a decision? So I can give you a description of the studies and I can say if you three are positive, two are negative, what do you think? Or I can use mathematical methods to combine the data across all the randomized control trials and give you actually the sum the overall effect from all the studies that are in the literature. That's a meta-analysis. It's a quantitative way, a mathematical way of combining different randomized control trials from different places to give you what the net value of the particular intervention looks like in the literature so far. So when you read the meta-analysis, you're going to see plots like this. You have an axis on the, the x-axis at the bottom, and you have a y-axis. And zero is in the middle of your x-axis. You have a line going through zero. Typically, if the studies are on one side, they favor the drug. If the study are on the other side, they favor placebo. And they should tell you. On the graph, they should tell you which side favors what. What you get is you get a little square that tells you how big the effect was. And you get a line going through that tells you how confident the measurement was, how, how much confidence we have in that particular measurement. And then at the bottom, where it says all studies, sometimes you get a square or a, or a diamond. That's the sum of all the studies. And you want it to not touch the zero line. So if it's not touching the zero line, it means overall the data favors the, the intervention. If it's touching the zero line, we don't have confidence in the intervention. Right? With me? So... The square is the size, how, how much the, 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 every study has changed. The, the line tells you whether it's really significant from zero, so whether we have confidence in every study. The sum at the bottom, where it says all studies, is the sum of all the studies, so how, what is the net effect of all the studies. And if it's not touching the zero line, you have confidence that your intervention works. So in this case, it's melatonin. So we have several clinical trials of melatonin now. I'm going to use examples from different disorders. Nothing I'm going to say today is specific to autism, ADHD, OCD, intellectual disability. There is no specificity to a diagnostic category. So when I pick a different example, I'm going to pick a different diagnosis just to show you the graphs. But nothing I say today is specific for any neurodevelopmental diagnosis, okay? So we're thinking about symptoms. And the symptom here is sleep insomnia. So if you look at the bottom graph and you see the all studies, you get a square and a line that goes through it that does not cross zero. This is a meta-analysis for sleep latency, meaning how long does it take you to fall asleep. So what it tells you is that melatonin is effective at treating kids who have what we call initial insomnia, difficulty falling asleep. Okay. So the bulk of data so far would support the use of melatonin for the treatment of initial insomnia, so difficulty falling asleep. Now, in my second graph, you will notice it looks a bit different. The square at the bottom has a line that goes through it and that touches the zero line. That means, so this, this is the analysis about not falling asleep but staying asleep. So what you're learning is that when we sum all the studies together, we have no evidence that melatonin helps you stay asleep, okay? So overall, the evidence for melatonin is that it helps with initial insomnia, so it helps you fall asleep, but if you have fragmented sleep, if you have multiple awakenings during the night, there is no evidence that melatonin works. With me? Good. All right, so that is the easiest example I could give you from a complementary treatment where we have nice evidence that has moved now more into mainstream. 
I'm going to move to a different example, and that's omega-3 fatty acids. And you guys asked quite a bit about that. So before I show you that, then I'm going to use ADHD as the example this time. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the omega-3 fatty acids. So there's many of them. And it's important when you buy omega-3 fatty acids that you look at the back of the label to actually make sure that you have the two components we care about. So the two components we care about are EPA and DHA. So you want the label to have EPA and DHA on it, first of all. They are slightly different, but they are both important to us. So DHA is very important for neurodevelopment. It's important for the development, for example, of vision. Um, and it's also very important for learning. EPA, on the other hand, is the most abundant fatty acid in our, our body. It's very important for mood regulation, anxiety and depression, for example. And it has the additive advantage that the body can convert it to DHA if it doesn't have enough DHA around. So if you have enough EPA around, you're probably in good shape because you can actually convert it to DHA if you don't have enough DHA. So again, when you pick a supplement, if you pick a supplement, you want to make sure you have both, but you absolutely need to make sure that you have EPA for our purposes in it. This, all supplements have side effects. Let's actually take a step back. I'm going to talk to you about com complementary and alternative treatments. If they have any chance of working, they also have an equal chance of producing a side effect. So this idea that if it's natural, it doesn't cause harm is impossible biologically, right? If it has the chance to work, it means that it affects a biological process. If it affects a biological process in a positive way, it can also affect the biological process in a negative way. So the idea that the natural route is safer than the traditional route is actually not true, and we have plenty of examples of that. So you should know the side effects of the supplements that you're taking, and that's another reason why you need to talk to us. So I can, when you tell me what you're taking, I'll tell you what you can expect in terms of the side effects of those compounds. So the common ones for EPA and DHA is that you get an upset stomach, you can get diarrhea, general gastrointestinal distress, you can start smelling fishy if it's not well distilled, so kids' skin can smell fishy, their sweat can smell fishy. Um, but the most important one that you need to know is that as you push the dose up, it actually interferes with vitamin K metabolism, which is a very important vitamin for blood clotting. So on the higher doses of the fish oils, we are getting bleeding. We're getting an uh, inability to clot blood in appropriate times. And so it is important for you to know that Health Canada and the FDA have actually published safety ranges for kids for these things, um, with a total of one gram uh, for kids under the age of eight and up to three, three grams for, kids, for people over the age of eight. Now, I wouldn't be giving you all of this if I didn't have some positive data, right? So I want to show you what it is good for, so far what it looks like it's good for. Um, but just for you to remember, there are side effects and there are safety ranges. The other reason that it's important for you to know the ranges is because, to be completely frank, you almost never exceed the safety range from the supplements you buy from your local pharmacies. They have tiny, tiny doses in. So even when you try them, you almost never get them close to the dose that has therapeutic effects. So you should know how high you can go and push the dose. So your, those little gummy things that you take with omega-3s, they have homeopathic uh, amounts of omega-3 in them. Like at the, at the, 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 the so if, if, you're, if, if what you want in a little one is like something above 500 milligrams to up to one gram, these things have 30 or 40 or 50 milligrams. So when you give those gummies, you don't actually have the potential of getting any therapeutic benefit. But let me show you where the therapeutic benefit is. And I'm going to pick up ADHD. So again, it's not about the label. It's about ADHD symptoms. Whether your primary diagnosis is ADHD, intellectual disability, autism, doesn't matter. If you have ADHD symptoms, this would apply. So this is an area where there are a lot of randomized control trials. So I'm going to show you again uh, a meta-analysis to get you familiar with those graphs. So uh, the first one is the meta-analysis for the EPA component for inattention. So you have a series of studies. You can look at the top, four studies. And then you have the summary effect in that little diamond. And you'll see it doesn't change. It doesn't touch zero. So you're pretty happy, right? So overall, the studies, the summary of the studies, although not all of them were positive, 
the summary effect shows a benefit for inattention. It doesn't touch zero, so you have confidence in the finding. Now, the difference between the upper and the lower part, if you look on the other side of the screen, is the dose. And that's why I talked to you about dose before. So the top is more than 500 milligrams of EPA. The bottom is less than 500 milligrams of EPA. So you'll see that the effect is still there on the lower dose. So for inattention, if you're going to take fatty acids, irrespectively of the dose, provided you don't give a tiny, tiny dose, uh, you should get an attention effect. I will get back to, to, to you in a second to tell you how big this effect is, but at least you get an effect. Now, if you get hyperactivity in the, the top part, you get a nice big size diamond that separates from zero, right? It doesn't touch zero. So you have evidence that omega-3 fatty acids, actually EPA, um, has a good impact on hyperactivity if your dose is over 500 milligrams. But look at the bottom. If your, if your dose is less than 500 milligrams, now your diamond is crossing that zero line. So basically what it says is don't bother giving less than 500 milligrams of EPA if what you're trying to get an effect on is hyperactive. Right? So dose matters. But overall, you'll see that if you push the dose up for this EPA, you get an effect on both attention and hyperactivity. Right? And the third thing that's important to know is that if you look at cognitive tests that measure how the brain actually works in kids who have ADHD symptoms, so how impulsive they are at making decisions and how inattentive they are when they do a task, in both cases, you get a nice diamond that separates from zero. So they call that an effect on cognition or effect on learning. So we do have evidence for omega-3 fatty acids, in particular the APA component, for improving attention and hyperactivity in kids and the basic cognitive processes that get impaired when we have um, inattention. That's the good news. The bad news now is you have to think about how big this effect is and you have to compare it to traditional treatments. So it is about half the effect size of Ritalin. Okay? Doesn't mean that it's useless, right? You, you have to make a decision that's appropriate for your kid and your family and yourself but you have to know what, how it compares. So overall, we have evidence that this supplementation works for ADHD-like symptoms, but either you're augmenting, so either you're getting an extra effect on top of other traditional therapies, or you better be having very mild ADHD symptoms that, that don't make it worth taking medication, uh, and you can still get a little bit of, a, a little bit of benefit from omega-3s, but if, when you compare them head to head, the effect size of this is about half what we get from the therapy. Right? So a good complementary option for um, ADHD-like symptoms, probably not a good alternative option unless you have very mild symptoms. With me? Good. Okay. Now, there is a complication to this. So all the kids in these studies um, are above five, so they're school-age children. And the only thing we looked at is ADHD-like symptoms, right? Inattention and hyperactivity. So how about other neurodevelopmental symptoms? So the question for the families that have intellectual disability, developmental delay, or autism was, can you accelerate the rate of learning if you give omega-3 fatty acids to the very little ones, the ones that are under five, um, so that they can maybe facilitate the brain processes that are involved in learning and make them learn faster? So we had that question. In this case, we don't have a systematic review. We have a randomized control trial because there are not enough of those studies around. So I'll show you one of ours that we completed a little, a little ago. So this was, this again, the case was in autism, but nothing specific about diagnosis here. So we took the little ones between two and five years, and we gave them six months of supplementation for omega-3 fatty, omega fatty acids, compared that to placebo, and look at the rate of maturation on social, learning, language, um, irritability, hyperactivity, behaviors. So it is a tricky graph, but basically all you need to know from this is that um, on the top, it's the domains of skill gain, so social, repetitive, language, communication. The light gray is your placebo, the, um, the dark, black is your drug, um, and in fact, you get bigger changes from that line on the placebo than, 
than the drug. Basically, the drug did not, the, the omega-3 fatty acids show no evidence of accelerating the acquisition of learning skills in the very little months. One more complication. So remember, I have shown you for traditional ADHD symptoms in the older kids, there seems to be benefit. In the little ones, if you get to this last graph at the end, the last graph category, which is externalizing behavior, so irritability and aggression, in fact, the drug made irritability statistically significantly worse. So omega-3 fatty acids in the older kids, when what you're trying to do is target attention, hyperactivity, you have evidence for. Little kids, you don't have evidence for facilitated learning. Um, and there is a bit of a risk for the little kids that you're going to make them irritable. Okay? So never a clean story. And again, just because it's a supplement doesn't mean that the only thing you can get is good stuff. You can actually get side effects because it affects biological mechanisms. All right. Um, Am I already out of time? I got 15 minutes, okay. Uh, I've done this before. We're out of time before it's my time. Okay, um, so I'm going to give you just another example of something that may have promised. So lots of you are asking questions about antioxidants. Um, and we have an interest in antioxidants. So generally speaking, oxidative stress is a potential target of intervention. So when our cells produce energy, there is wear and tear, and as part of the wear and tear of producing energy in the body, we actually um, produce um, what we call free radicals that actually can damage ourselves. And we know that in, in conditions that affect the brain, we have high oxidative stress. So there is more evidence of that wear and tear in kids who have neurodevelopmental conditions than kids who don't. So generally speaking, as a general target, we are very interested in the target. How to go about this target is a very difficult problem because these are very complex, well-developed systems. Um, and so you asked me lots of questions about specific antioxidants and I just don't have a clue, but I will give you the ones where we have a clue um, and uh, with a few caveats. So N-acetylcysteine is a supplement you can buy off the, off the counter. I think if you look at the supplement boxes, it says something like liver health uh, detoxification, liver health immune boosting, or something like this. Um, there are medical reasons why we use an acetylcysteine in emergency situations. So if somebody has a Tylenol over, um, overdose, uh, the way we protect their liver is by giving an acetylcysteine. And for people who have chronic conditions that have very thick mucus, like cystic fibrosis, we will ask them, we will have them inhale an acetyl system to break up the mucus uh, to make it easier for them to breathe. But none of that seems to be relevant to what we're talking about, right? So it looks like an acetyl system is important for glutathi glutathione biosynthesis, and glutathione is a very important antioxidant. It also has some other central effects in the brain uh, in the glutamate system. So we were curious whether an acetyl system as a supplement may have potential therapeutic effects. And I'm going to show you two examples from two different disorders. So the first one is the autism story. So we, we have a randomized control trial now of an essential system compared to placebo for kids who have chronic irritability and some self-injury. And so red is the drug. Blue is placebo over 12 weeks, over three months. And we see by week four, the drug starts outperforming our supplement starts outperforming the placebo, and by then we have a consistent benefit on kids who take an acetyl system over the kids who take placebo. So in our book, this is starting to move from the supplement world to the medication world for chronic irritability. In OCD, there are multiple trials, so we can actually do a meta-analysis. Hold that thought, and I'll come right back. Oh. Sorry, sorry. Yep, I just realized I have this problem. Thank you. No, 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 that's good. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So, yes, if you can see by week four, the anesthetic system is starting to outperform the placebo. So, placebo is blue, and anesthetic system is red. You're looking at decreasing irritability, so you get a bigger decrease on the anesthetic system than you get on placebo. Right? Chronic irritability, a little bit of self injury. 
But as I said, none of these things are, have any specificity for any specific diagnostic label. So people are checking them across different diagnoses. And so the story with OCD is now that we have a variety of studies for OCD uh, with an acetyl cysteine as augmentative treatment. So that's complementary, not alternative, right? In addition to the traditional um, drug for OCD. So you'll see if you just look at the green slots, you had two positive trials and two negative trials. God knows what you need to make of that, but when you actually mathematically combine those studies, you get what we are calling a very significant trend. So it actually touches zero, so it's not, we don't have full confidence in this, but it barely touches zero. For those of you who are um, mathematically inclined, the p-value for them for this systematic review is sitting at 0.06, uh, 0 0.05 is our threshold, so we're very close to having confidence that an acetyl cysteine in some kids with OCD may provide additional benefit as a complementary treatment, so in addition to their traditional uh, medication. So again, it's an example of an antioxidant that across populations seems to be providing some additional benefit compared to either standard treatment or no treatment at all, right? but more of the evidence as a complementary agent. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna show you one that some of you won't like me about, <laughs> um, uh, which is the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So the populations that have mostly been exposed to these are kids with autism, kids with intellectual disability. Um, and there has been tons of hype on uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's extremely expensive. Um, it's not covered by healthcare system. So we thought we should look at it in a systematic way. I don't have a meta-analysis plot to show you for this one. I can get into the details of why we are interested later, but I want to show you that there are several studies of hyperbaric oxygen treatment in ASD and intellectual disability, and the overall conclusion is no evidence of effect. So we're not having evidence of harm, but we don't have evidence of effect. Now, there's a caveat to this. Most people, when they get hyperbaric oxygen therapy for a neurodevelopmental condition, they don't get the full hyperbaric oxygen protocol. So what we have noticed in these studies is that the, the, the kids are not put in ad adequate pressure chambers, uh, pre chambers that have adequate pressure to call it hyperbaric. So there are two ways to look at this. One is to say that the true experiment hasn't been done because people use low pressure in the hyperbaric treatment trials. But the other way is to ask the question, why? So I told you that we cannot recommend it because we have no evidence, but we don't have evidence of harm. But the problem is that the reason they're not giving the full pressure is because on full pressure you have evidence of harm. Because you can break your tympanic membrane, so you can get pierced ears, um, you can get seizures, you can get a, a few other things when you use proper pressure. So overall, the evidence would suggest that this is not something we would recommend for kids with intellectual disability or kids with autism. And my most extreme example then would be chelation therapy. And there was quite a bit of stuff on the news uh, in the last few months. I don't know if you guys saw them. There are plenty of physicians in Ontario that do prescribe chelation therapy. So I'm just, you're, you're hearing my opinion based on the available data, data right? I can't comment on other people's practices. But I will say at this point, we have a large clinical trial and a systematic review. And at this point, this is a treatment where we have no evidence of effect and evidence of harm. So in my classification of things, this is at the bottom, right? You have no evidence of benefit and you have evidence of harm. So you would get the strongest possible discouragement from me from doing chelation therapy. But remember, if you're going to do it, you still have to tell me because you're going to get metabolic abnormalities and I need to know about it so I can keep you safe. Yes. Chelation therapy, I apologize. So chelation therapy, so the, the origins of chelation therapy come outside of neurodevelopment. So if you get poisoning, let's say there's an industrial accident and there is a heavy metal that gets leaked and the community around gets poisoned by the heavy metal, we can go in and use a series of strategies that include filtering the blood, blood basically out to get the bad stuff out of the system. The way we traditionally do it is in the intensive care unit. We attach to all kinds of monitors um, and we get the bad stuff out, whether it's lead or mercury or whatever other metal it is. 
this practice is an in-home, in-doctor's in, um, office practice of trying to take heavy metals out of kids' blood on the assumption that a lot of our neurodevelopmental disorders are caused by heavy metal toxicity. Okay? And so we have no evidence that it works, and we've had three kids in the literature that have died during the procedure, and we have many more kids who show up in the emergency room with metabolic abnormalities, because when we take the metals out, you, take, you change a whole lot of other things. So you change the minerals and the concentrations of the minerals in the blood that actually keep the heart going and the kidneys going and all of that. So we're getting toxicity, right? So we're causing harm. So there is no way you'll get me to tell you <laughs> that it's a benign intervention, right? I would discourage you the strongest possible way, but still please tell me if you're going to do it if you're in my practice, right? Or your doctor's practice because they need to know that, they need to be monitoring for that, they need to have a high index of suspicion. <clears throat> um, all right, so these were my examples, and then I wanted to touch two more uh, places where you guys in the forms that you sent us in advance when you registered had a lot of questions on. One was stem cells, and the other one was kind of BDL and cannabis. So stem cells, I'm not gonna show you slides, I'm gonna tell you the story very quickly. So, um, Typically, stem cell therapy is reserved for cases where you have a, le a clear lesion in the brain. So you have damaged nerve cells, damaged neurons, and then you send these stem cells to go up to that region to actually regenerate if you like that region, to repopulate that region. This is not the case in autism. So at the beginning, there was no biological obvious way that we were thinking that stem cell was going to work. A second mechanism was proposed later on that has to do with immune modulation. So the idea that if you infuse somebody with stem cells, you actually change the complement of the immune system that may have positive effects for a variety of conditions that have immune differences, including autism. I have to tell you that my personal expectations are low from this program, but there is at least a very well-designed program out of Duke University that's running right now. There has been no RCT published, so anything you've heard is on the open label side. And remember, if you don't compare to placebo, you don't know if your effect is from placebo or whether you actually have an intervention effect. So, so far, we have seen no results that compare stem cells to placebo, right? But the, the data is coming. So I would say, hold on to your horses when it comes to this one, because there is potential harm, right? So anytime you do a stem cell infusion, you can get anything from anaphylactic shock all the way to a blood product, contaminated blood product infection, right? So these are not trivial interventions. And so I would say you hold off until the, the research program is out or be part of the research program. So even that, I'm having a little bit of struggle because some of you have actually gone down to the Duke program to be part of the trial, but you have paid for it. So my, my general feeling is if you're part of a research study, we are grateful to you, we cover all your expenses. You don't pay for research because research is not clinical care. It's an experiment, right? You guys contribute to the experiment so we can learn from you. So if you have to spend $10,000 to go down to do, to do this study, my personal <laughs> uh, thing is if you have the extra 10,000 box, get an actual clinical service um, and let the study run. And then when we know what the results are, we can have a discussion. Cannabis, though, there's no way I can tell you to hold off by now. So I'm going to um, tell you a bit more about it. So uh, across developmental disorders, there's an interest in cannabis. Um, and we're getting tons and tons of questions from all of you and from every parent that comes to the clinic. I have to stop. But I'm back. Okay. Um, I, so the, the story goes as this. This has not been an RCD, so it never has been a randomized controlled trial for any components of cannabis. So not cannabidiol, not DHC for autism per se, right? There is a small, what they call, open label study that I put up there because this guy stopped quite a bit, so you may hear the names in the news. But I want you to know what that study is. It's a retrospective chart review, right? So they treated a bunch of kids and then they went back and looked to see if they have benefit, right? Now, it is true that parents are reporting some benefit when, in an open label fashion, they take uh, uh, some aspect of cannabis, mostly cannabidiol, but also a little bit of the DHC component. 
Um, and so there is some interest as to whether there is a therapeutic potential of this compound on the ASD side. Um, and there is probably going to be a trial that comes to Canada from a pharmaceutical company in the next couple of years. So if that happens, we will probably participate and you are welcome to come to the research program um, to, to, to do the experiment, right? Now, the only target of all the things that our kids care, uh, worry about that has some evidence for cannabis um, is epilepsy, but certain types of epilepsy, and anxiety, right? And so some of you have chosen to get a medical prescription for medical marijuana for anxiety or epilepsy. And again, I will say that the evidence is not there, but sometimes we don't have evidence, so I respect your opinion to do what you think is right for your kid. The risk that there are two risks that I want you to be aware of. One is that there are tons of interactions between cannabidiol and other common drugs that we use. So if, if you're gonna hide anything from your doctor, this is one you don't hide, right? Lots of the common drugs that we use have interactions with cannabidiol. Tell us about it so we can adjust the doses properly so we don't become toxic. The second thing I need you to know is that there are long-term effects of cannabis in the developing brain that have to do with modulation of the reward system. We don't know how much we need to worry about these things yet because the trials are not done, right? So you are basically becoming the first group of people who get exposed if you choose to do that without having a sense of what the safety profile looks like. And again, I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but you need to know what it looks like. On the ADHD side, it's a bit tricky because there is a little bit of data for a little bit of benefit from cannabis in adults with ADHD. It's a small study that came out of the European Consortium. The problem is, that's why I put both studies there. The one says, a randomized control trial, and the other says, is cannabis use associated with the worst possible outcomes? So the problem is for ADHD that although there is a, a small benefit to treatment with cannabis, the people who tend, end up using cannabis tend to have worse outcomes. So we don't know how to separate those two. The most likely explanation is that people who use cannabis to self-medicate are already, to begin with, a little worse, or they may get other comorbid diagnoses around um, substance abuse um, that predict worse outcomes. But again, it's not a clean story, and a lot of caution is warranted when you think about cannabidiol use. So this is my final slide, because I'm out of time. But this is like back, going back to my question. So remember, I have likely effective, generally say, I will help you through it. Well tolerated, but unknown effectiveness. If you want to do it, I'll help you, but I don't recommend it. Well tolerated, but I know it's not working, so I will tell you not to waste your money. And then I'll say, please, please, please don't do it, but still tell me you do it. So I'll just put lists of things there. So in the first category, the likely effective with probably acceptable safety, we have melatonin, we have omega-3 for ADHD, we have some of the antioxidants, and then I didn't even go into the non-medication practices, right? So uh, mindfulness, if you're, going, if you're going to call mindfulness alternative, which I personally think has already moved into mainstream, uh, that would be in that category. Sensory interventions, I personally don't feel they're that controversial. Occupational therapists have been, have been treating kids forever, very effectively, and so I would say they belong in the alternative part of the world. Uh, where we actually have some evidence and no evidence of harm. If you think of the well tolerated, but I don't know if they're doing anything, there's tons of things. Um, honestly, if you want to try them, you can ask me specific questions about the specific compounds, but these are the kinds of things that if you tell me you want to do them, I'll just document it and make sure it doesn't interact and I follow with you. So most vitamins are in that category, most other antioxidants are in that category. The casein gluten-free diets, in my opinion, are in that category, although you should know there is some evidence of harm uh, in terms of, of uh, the majority of kids on those diets, diets do have nutritional deficiency. Um, some digestive enzymes. The omega-3 fatty acids for the very little one, because I told you the study that was, where we had no effect. Um, most of the non-biological interventions that are out in the community, vision therapy, manual therapy, acupuncture, um, neurofeedback actually is almost moving to the first one. So there are some kids who get a little bit of benefit on neurofeedback, especially around attention. A lot of kids don't, so we don't have the, the mechanics uh, figured out yet. The music therapy exercise and animal-assisted therapies are also, for me, 
starting to move. So there is a little bit of evidence in any of those categories that shows a little bit of benefit um, in the case of animal assisted therapies on safety and um, so safe behaviors on, on the, in the community and anxiety. Music therapy, we now have an RCT with some benefit in language acquisition in the little one. And exercise, we actually have a good biological mechanism now of how it works and emerging data for having widespread behavioral good effects, right? And probiotics, which I put in orange because that's the one we put, we as a network are putting most of our money on right now. So you're going to see in the next year or so, we are planning to uh, follow up with a new trial cross-diagnostic categories with probiotics, looking at both internalizing, so anxiety symptoms, and externalizing symptoms, so ADHD, uh, irritability. No evidence, discourage you, is hyperbaric, secreting, secreting. And of the listening therapies, I know some of you are going to be very upset, is the auditory integration training. And the reason I pull it out and I put it in this category is because now we have an randomized control trial. And it's totally negative. It's completely identical to placebo. So it's very hard for me to tell you to spend your money in that category. And in the bottom one, I have chelation. I explained why. Does anybody know what MMS or bleach therapies are? Yeah, so for some of you who say yes, uh, there is a group of therapies that have to do with cleaning your gut. It's basically bleach derivatives. They're truly harmful. Like, please talk to us before you engage in these things. We'll tell you why it's bad. Uh, bleaching your gut is not a good thing for anybody, right? Even if you have toxic stuff in your gut, don't, you don't bleach your gut. Um, and then certain herbs, or oh, that one I want to highlight and then I'm going to stop talking, is um, so lots of herbs have positive effects. Our grandmothers raised us some <laughs> herbs for sleep and this and the other, right? But there are toxic toxic herbs out there, so I really need you to be telling me when you come to your doctor's office um, what it is you're on. Uh, we have kids who had liver failure and went on the liver transplant list based on certain herbal supplements. So there's lots of good stuff, there are lots of benign stuff, but there are some really, truly toxic stuff. So just tell us before you use the herbal supplements. And I'm going to stop at this, and I'm going to take some questions. I'll repeat it, yeah. Yes, so melatonin is kind of interesting because, so melatonin is a hormone we produce all of us in our brain. That's how we go to sleep. So when the sun goes down, melatonin gets produced and we feel sleepy and we go to bed, right? It looks like, unlike anything else we know, we have the high secretion of melatonin where we're babies and it goes down with age. So we need less and less as we grow, right? So the range really does go from 0.5 to about 9, or some people say 12 milligrams. But it is possible that the little ones actually need more than the, as the kids grow up. But the, the range is safe up to definitely 9, and for most kids, 12. Yes? You're welcome. Yes. Hello. Are we making? Okay. 
So let me, let, let yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So give me a chance. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so first of all, thank you. These are the big questions, right? They're not like two second questions that I can answer right away. Maybe I'll grab a couple of those for now because they are related. And then I'm talking again at the end of the day about the research updates and I'll tell you about the research updates then. Is that okay? So, um, so the first thing is I think we have to be a bit careful about the use of word cure because these things are developmental differences. So whether we're talking about autism or ADHD or OCD, Basically, the brain wires different, and it just produces a different kind of brain. A different kind of brain can have lots of strengths, and it can have lots of weaknesses. We're not talking about taking away the difference. The difference starts very early on in fetal life, and frankly, it comes with positive things also. But what we're talking about is taking away all the distress and the disability, right? So if we're talking about taking all the distress and the disability, remind me what the first question was. Um, hmm? Yes, so good outcomes. Yeah, thank you very much. So, the, yes, I got it. So, so thank you. So, so the first question you asked is about whether we have kids who no longer have autism or ADHD or whatever have you. Yes. So I, I would not put it down to a miracle. <laughs> These are developmental differences, right? So kids grow and they follow a, different, a whole list of different developmental trajectories. So for example, 10%, at least 10% of kids with autism, when they grow up, they no longer meet criteria for autism. So it's not a once in a while miracle thing. It doesn't happen overnight. Kids grow, follow different developmental trajectories. And about 10% of kids who start with autism when they're adults, they no longer have autism. Right? And that is even before we did treatment intervention. So this data comes from the UK, where they follow people who are now in their 30s. So remember, think about what it is that we did 30 years ago, right? So it is possible that our generation of kids will have a bigger percentage of kids who actually no longer meet criteria. ADHD is the same way, right? So there is a group of kids with ADHD. As they grow up, the symptoms become less and less obvious, and by the time they hit adulthood, they no longer have a disability as, as part of their um, kind of picture. They may have some differences in the way they attend, uh, or they may be a bit fidgety or hypermotoric, but they no longer have a disability. So yes, because these are developmental differences, some kids grow out of their spectrum, whatever their spectrum is, right? In and out, day and night, is biologically almost impossible, right? Because the brain has developed in a different manner. So we don't expect the brain to all of a sudden overnight rewire itself and have a different presentation the next morning. And I'll, I'll probably get to the etiology and then I'll hold the other two for later, okay? So the etiology, um, so we're up to about 20 to 25% of kids with autism or intellectual disability where we find a clear genetic cause. Remember, when we talk about genetic cause, we don't mean inherited. We mean that it lives in the genes, but only half of the time it lives in the rest of the family. Half of the time, it just happens randomly at the time of conception, right? So, but we find in a quarter of the kids a clear genetic association with their developmental concern. ADHD is a little bit different because in the case of autism and intellectual disability, a single gene, a single rare gene, can have a very large effect and be enough to produce the, to cause the autism of intellectual disability. In ADHD, that's possible also, but the majority of the time what happens is you have more genes who have smaller effects that in the right combination produce something that looks like ADHD. So this is the genetic side of things. Then we know there are rare cases of certain infections. So we know there are environmental things that can happen during 
fetal life, but are associated with a large increase in autism. So certain infections are the ones that we understand more about. For example, measles, that's why everybody needs to be vaccinated. So measles and rubella during pregnancy massively increases the chance of a kid becoming autistic when they are born, right? Um, so we, during periods of large influenza outbreaks, we know overall the rates of autism go up, the rates of intellectual disability go up. So we know that there are some environmental things that interact with our genes during the early environment in fetal life to increase the rates of autism. We don't have an example yet of an environmental factor on its own that it's enough to produce either autism or intellectual disability or ADHD or OCD, right? So it looks like environmental factors are interacting with our genetic background and produce a variety of different brains. And, and different brains would look different when the kids kind of uh, grow up. So this is where we are. We don't have a single cause. We have some genetic causes. We know we have some gene by environment interactions and we keep working on it. So that's part of what we are studying in POND, right? So, 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 so let me give you my honest opinion on this one, and then we can wrap it up, and we can talk after. Okay, so vaccines is the easy one for me. There is no evidence. We have looked and looked and looked. We cannot find a link between vaccines and autism. The pollution and the processed foods are all good hypotheses, right? So we know certain environmental things interact with the genes, but we need to actually pin it down. And so far, they're as good candidates as any, but we don't have evidence to tell you whether it's true or not, right? What I would really like you to think about, though, all of us, is that autism or ADHD or intellectual disability, they are the, not the only things that are, that are produced distress and dysfunction, right? When we know that something is bad for our body and our brain, whether it causes autism or not is irrelevant. The point is it's bad for us, right? So, if we know that certain pollutants or certain exposures or certain pesticides are causing harm, we need to actually group together and work for that, whether we call that autism or ADHD or intellectual disability or another medical condition completely unrelated to neurodevelopment. So the problem with environmental stuff is that we get too focused on figuring out which developmental disorder is associated with them. But if we have evidence of harm as a community, we need to kind of group together and work try to get stuff that we have evidence for harm out of our food chains, our food supplies. So I share your, your concerns, but I, I, I don't have the link, the proof for autism. But I would also say we have plenty of evidence that does other bad things. Autism is not the only thing.